Hi, you're watching Source Material, a brand new series from Digital Spy. This week, we're getting mean, green, and legally and contractually compliant with Jennifer Walters, aka the She-Hulk. Ahead of the Disney Plus series launching this August, we're here to give you a primer on the character's origins, some key runs from the comics, and what to expect from the show itself. Okay, so before we dive into the comic book origin story, it's worth thinking a little bit about how the She-Hulk character came to the page in the first place. It's kind of a unique and interesting story if you don't know it, so bear with us. She-Hulk's origins. Um, in case you didn't know, She-Hulk was actually created by Stan Lee, and she was the last character made by Stan Lee before he took a 12-year break in the 80s, so she's kind of noteworthy from the get-go. The reason that Marvel created She-Hulk actually has less to do with the character and more to do with the success of the Incredible Hulk TV series and the creation of the Bionic Woman TV show. Basically, in the 70s, the people who made the $6 million Man show owned the rights to the character and anything that span off from it because they made the show itself, which meant that when they made a gender-flipped version of the character, aka the Bionic Woman, Woman, they kept all the rights. Now, Marvel were worried that because of the success of the Incredible Hulk show, that the TV company would do the same there. And so to sort of beat them to the post, they created She-Hulk as basically an insurance, meaning that anyone who made a gender flipped version of Hulk would have to kind of pay them rights and they would own the copyright for that character. As for the character herself, She-Hulk's kind of alter ego, although it doesn't really kind of work that way with this character, is Jennifer Walters, who is a lawyer. Jennifer Walters is also the cousin of Bruce Banner, um, and it is due to that relation that she ends up with her Hulk powers. Basically, in her first solo issue, issue number one of the Savage She-Hulk, she gets shot by a defendant who she's prosecuting, and in order to save her, Bruce Banner gives her a blood transfusion, which in classic comics logic, gives her his gamma powers and means that she can transform into this kind of like green, super powered version of herself. I think what's interesting when talking about her and Bruce and the original Hulk is that unlike Hulk and the friction that exists between Bruce Banner and his alter ego, certainly to start with, Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk are very much two sides of the same coin. Um, Jennifer doesn't really have the kind of resentment towards the She-Hulk that Bruce has to his Hulk. She can see the benefit and she can see the value of kind of hulking out when she needs to. And often there are legal cases where it's useful to have She-Hulk behind the stand. And similarly, there are kind of superhero situations where it's useful for the human Jennifer Walters to come to the front. Um, so that's basically where the character came from and where she got her powers from. Um, but what about the comics runs that you should be thinking about and you should be paying attention to ahead of the Disney Plus series? Well, let's take a look. The most important She-Hulk comic books. Okay, so there are really three eras of She-Hulk solo runs in particular to be thinking about or paying attention to. That is the original run, which started in 1982. That's the Savage She-Hulk. There's the John Byrne and kind of late 80s, early 90s sensational She-Hulk run, which is arguably the most influential and important. And then towards more recent years, we've kind of got the 21st century grouping, which includes Dan Slott's single green female run and some other more contemporary comics that Marvel has produced. The Savage She-Hulk, which started in 1982. Jennifer Walters' first outing, The Savage She-Hulk number one, comes out in 1982, and the first issue of that run is written by Stan Lee. The rest of the series is written by David Anthony Kraft and drawn by Michael Vosberg. Sadly, the great David Anthony Kraft um, passed away in 2021, but his legacy and this character live on, and I think it's worth thinking about him if you go back and read Savage, because it's a great run, and there's so much love in that writing, and he was clearly a very talented artist. This is a kind of classic early 80s Marvel comic. The art is really beautiful. It's all these kind of really crisp lines. Um, it's really kind of packed with motion and dynamism and is a really fun kind of low stakes, um, kind of cheap thrills, if you like, um, version of the character and kind of lays the foundation and the framework for lots of things that will come to pass. Lots of the stories in Savage She-Hulk kind of revolve around uh, the tension that grows between Jen's She-Hulk side and her lawyer side and her attempt to kind of maintain personal relationships and professional relationships from both halves. Although the Savage She-Hulk run is definitely worth a read, there's not a ton in those initial kind of 24 issues that are maybe worth thinking about going forward. Not a lot of it kind of gets held on to, apart from the origin story which you mentioned, wherein she's kind of shot in the back and has a blood transfusion. Um, we do meet a few characters that get mentioned again, but I think the only 
one of real note from that initial run is her dad, Sheriff Walters. And actually, her relationship with her dad in that comic is one of the most interesting parts of it. Um, he is a, a police chief, um, and at first, I think She-Hulk is like responsible for his daughter's death, which means he hates her. And then he's kind of like poisoned against um, Jen as a character as well by his girlfriend at the time. Um, but beyond that, not a lot of those characters and arcs kind of get pulled through. As seen with her relationship with the father, um, a lot of the kind of overarching plots and the through lines in the Savage She-Hulk run come between or come from Jen's inability to marry those two halves of her life. So she um, has relationships as Jennifer Walters and she has relationships as She-Hulk, both kind of amicable, professional, but also romantic. And when those things clash, that's where a lot of the kind of like fun of the comic comes from. There's a boy next door who's lived next to Jennifer her whole, whole life called Zappa, um, who's a really funny, extremely 80s character. They go like surfing at one point, it's very good. Um, and that is a, he is a character who the She-Hulk is really into, but Jennifer sees as like a friend. And although they're not two distinct identities, the two sides of the She-Hulk's personality kind of interact with the world in those ways. And that's kind of interesting and quite, quite unique. And that will be something that you see across all kind of She-Hulk stories. There are a few specific issues from Savage She-Hulk that I want to call out though, um, especially in the beginning run, if you do end up looking at it. There is a really funny um, issue where she goes to Florida um, to help out with something and she wrestles an alligator and it's just like such a glorious early 80s panel of like She-Hulk throwing an alligator around. It makes me laugh. It's definitely worth having a look at. Um, there's also a really funny bit in the beginning of the run where some mobsters attempt to like best her by using this repurposed Iron Man suit, but they kind of like drag up the Iron Man suit to look like She-Hulk. So this is like this really funny panel of, of an Iron Man suit, an 80s Iron Man suit, like bursting through a wall, but it's got this like big black wig on. Um, it's just very funny and very camp as a lot of those stories were. Another interesting, again, and really kind of beautiful in terms of the artwork um, issues and some arcs are uh, an issue in the middle of it where Jennifer kind of like teams up with this interdimensional um, astronaut, uh, the, the man wolf, who is actually um, J. Jonah Jameson, you know, the guy from Spider-Man, his son, um, who is also a David Anthony Kraft, the guy who's writing Savage She-Hulk, a creation of his. Um, she teams up with man wolf um, to kind of like free and help these interdimensional barbarians. It's like a really, really psychedelic arc, which, you know, is a lot of what was happening at the time. And so there's like all these crazy splash pages of um, people like within Jen's bloodstream and there are like universes colliding. Um, it's really striking visually. And again, although it doesn't have the most kind of depth and substance to it, is really emblematic of the kind of artistic work that's happening at Marvel at the time. And it's definitely worth picking up and having a leaf through um, if you can. The Sensational She-Hulk and John Byrne. So the Savage She-Hulk run ends in 1982 and it's about seven years until Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk get another solo run. But in the meantime, she goes on lots of big crossover adventures. And this is really the start of that kind of like cameo queen status that Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk have, because she does pop up in everyone else's books. She joins the Avengers in Avengers 221, which comes out in 1982 that year. Um, and as part of the Avengers, she goes on lots of big adventures. Um, one of the main things that happens in that Avengers run is um, the first Secret Wars event, which we do not have time to dig into now. Um, but the key things that kind of that are She-Hulk related that happen in Secret Wars actually pertain to Titania, um, her kind of on, on again, off again nemesis. Um, and we'll get more into Titania's backstory later on in the video, but just kind of remember that this is when we really get introduced to her and her kind of wild, wild side. So after that Avengers run, um, the end of Secret Wars happens, and as part of that, Ben Grimm, aka The Thing, decides to stay in Battleworld, don't worry about it. Um, and as a result, a slot has opened up on the Fantastic Four, and it's a slot that Jennifer Walters, aka She-Hulk, um, fills. Uh, it's really cool because she gets to kind of do more superheroics, but it does mean that her legal career is put on pause for now. Okay, so Sensational She-Hulk. Um, in 1989, She-Hulk gets her new solo series. Um, it's written and drawn by kind of legendary comics artist John Byrne, or certainly he writes and pencils the first eight issues. And Sensational is really, for lots of people, the kind of most influential and most important She-Hulk run. Um, it's where a lot of her personality is really fleshed out. And it's also, the, it's famous for kind of bringing in this idea that she can break the fourth wall. She does a lot of meta commentary. You know, she's self-aware that she's a comic book character. All of the things that people love about the She-Hulk 
character, which you know predates Deadpool substantially, all come from this one run by John Byrne. In case you didn't know, John Byrne, like I said, is a legendary comic book artist. Um, he's famous for lots of work with Marvel across this period, and perhaps for me, most famous for his work with you know, incredible X-Men writer Chris Claremont for his work on the Dark Phoenix saga and also um, the two-issue Days of Future Past mini art. John Byrne's writing is is, is now legendary and his, and his art is incredible. Um, it's worth noting, I think, before we kind of move on from Sensational and John Byrne's work, that over the years he has said and done things which lots of people have construed as, you know, kind of xenophobic and transphobic um, and has become sort of, unfortunately, a controversial figure within comics. That said, you know, comics are not just down to the work of one person. Lots of people work on these books, and I think it's worth thinking about that and bearing it in mind, but it's also worth, you know, talking about all the great things that come from the Sensational She-Hulk run itself. What makes Sensational so fun is not only is the writing hilarious, but it's meta in a way that I think even in 2022 feels really fresh. Um, right from the get-go, Jennifer and She-Hulk are having conversations with the reader, they're talking directly through the panels to you, but they're also engaging with um, the writer, so they kind of talk at John Byrne a lot, they talk to the editor a lot, um, the covers are very self-effacing. It's this really kind of like punchy, fresh vibe, and you can see why at the time it was kind of blew people away. I definitely think it's worth picking up and reading certainly the first eight issues of Sensational if you can. Um, lots of stuff kind of gets laid down in terms of tone that will recur, across kind of She-Hulk's appearances, if not in content itself. Um, some things that do, or mainly the, the kind of one thing that I think recurs is her boss in doing Sensational is District Attorney Towers. Um, he pops up throughout her other runs and is definitely someone to remember. Another thing to pay attention to, I think, from Sensational She-Hulk is the character of Louise Mason, who is District Attorney Towers' assistant and kind of helps She-Hulk out with lots of different things. Louise Mason is a character that die-hard comic book fans, kind of people who know their comics inside and out, will also know as the Blonde Phantom. She is a 1940s character from the kind of golden age of comics, and, and she recurs in Sensational She-Hulk to be another layer of metafiction. She basically talks to Jennifer and talks to us and to John Byrne about the ways in which when comic book characters aren't on the page, their lives change and they age. In issue number three, there's this really interesting arc where we learn that after the Blonde Phantom was no longer in comics, um, the character like ages. So when we meet Louise Mason in Sensational, she's like a much older woman. We also find out that her husband, who was also a Golden Age character, um, has died. And so she has metafictionally, intentionally inserted herself into the Sensational she Hulk comic in order to keep living, basically. Um, it's this really interesting toying with the form. It's, it, it still feels, I think, quite radical now, like I said earlier. Um, and it is an expression of how much love for comics is in this book. Like every page, every minor character has some reference to kind of golden age comics. And I think, although it might go over the head of modern readers, there's clearly so much care and attention to the medium kind of present in, in every issue. We would be remiss when talking about Sensational She-Hulk, not to mention two issues and two covers in particular that got on the bad side of the Comics Code Authority. The Comics Code Authority, if you didn't know, in kind of very short terms, were a self-enforced regulatory body um, made up of uh, board members from different comics companies. And the idea was at the time in the 50s and 60s, the US government was looking to clamp down and censor the types of content that could be available in media for children. As a result of that, and to avoid kind of government censorship and government regulation, the comic book companies themselves grouped together and said, don't do that, we'll put together our own board, our own list of rules that we would, we'll adhere to um, to kind of protect their business. Um, that list of rules includes so the sorts of things you might expect from a 60s and 70s kind of like comics rule book. So, you know, that's no gratuitous sex, no nudity, no kind of overtly graphic violence. But it also has some interesting knock-on effects. One of the big rules is about the way that crime is depicted and how you can't make the villains and criminals in these superhero books overly sympathetic so that you don't end up kind of glamour, quote unquote, glamorizing a criminal lifestyle. Um, I think that's worth thinking about whenever you read comics from this era and how both writers were able to kind of navigate that and how that might impact 
the type of stories that we get. So two issues of Sensational She-Hulk really test the limits of the Comics Code Authority. The first one is issue number 32. Um, basically, the cover of this issue is a parody slash homage to a issue cover of Vanity Fair, which came out that year, which had actress Demi Moore kind of nude and pregnant on the cover. It's quite a striking image. Um, and the She-Hulk cover basically is kind of like a, a parody of that. And it has She-Hulk holding a big kind of green beach ball. Um, you can probably tell from that image why it got in trouble with the CCA, but again, it's interesting to think about the covers kind of engaging with comics more generally because of that. And then again, in issue 40, the CCA got annoyed again because basically the cover of this issue is uh, She-Hulk with kind of news, she's nude again, as she kind of often is, which is, you know, an unfortunate side effect of lots of things of the era. She's nude again and she's covered by newsprint that says um, Comics Code Authority approved across her, um, which is obviously like very tongue in cheek. And then you go into the comic and the first kind of four pages are basically um, She-Hulk like skipping rope and the rope, the blur lines from the rope are across her like chest and crotch. It's not like a particularly subtle image, I don't think, um, but it is, it, it's gratuitous, yes, but it is also interesting academically to think about the way that Sensational was toying with form and like really wants to talk about comics to the extent that they're, you know, Marvel is risking lots of things, I think, by playing this kind of cat and mouse game with the CCA. So after John Byrne's Sensational She-Hulk run, the character doesn't get another solo series until 2004, although she does appear in a large number of Avengers and kind of big crossover events that happen throughout the 90s. And again, like I said, she kind of is the cameo queen, which you might not know if you're only familiar with her now because of the MCU, but she really is a major character and she pops up all over the place. So, you know, throughout this list, every time there's a gap between solo issues and solo series, She-Hulk is everywhere. You know, this character is a sensation um, for a reason. She-Hulk in the 21st century. In May 2004, She-Hulk gets her next solo run, written by Dan Slott and drawn by one Bobbio. Um, often this era is kind of referred to as like the single green female era, because that is the name that was given to the trade paperback, and I think that is the name of issue number one. I absolutely love this run. Um, I think it is going to be the basis of lots of what we see in the TV series. The whole point of uh, Dan Slott's She-Hulk run is that she is a lawyer that goes to work for a firm called GLK and H, um, and she is put on a floor and she looks after exclusively um, superhuman and superheroic cases. So basically it's this blend of, it's kind of like the She-Hulk fantasy, like it's kind of like the, the platonic form of what a She-Hulk story could be, right? Because it's this melding of the superheroic world around her and her legal background. So, you know, she's she's on the, she's on the stand, she's kind of like defending and prosecuting cases to do with people with powers or people who've been kind of hurt in accidents relating to kind of weird and mystical events. Um, so in lots of ways, this is sort of, if Sensational She-Hulk by John Byrne is a kind of template for that kind of fourth wall breaking, very meta, sardonic She-Hulk, this for me is the kind of, the golden era of of the, the lawyer side, the Jennifer Walters almost, if you like. If, if, if Sensational She-Hulk is the, the best She-Hulk version we have, then I kind of think the Dan Slot stuff is the best Jennifer Walters style stories out there. Another really cool thing about the Dan Slot 2004 series is the way it tackles the kind of metafictional aspect of She-Hulk. Um, she's way less self-aware than she was in the John Byrne run. She doesn't kind of speak to the reader or speak to the writer through the panels in the way she did in that comic. But what we do get is this really interesting toying with the idea of comics within the Marvel Universe. In the Dan Slott run, what's really interesting is the way in which Jennifer Walters uses previous issues of famous comics and previous issues of She-Hulk to kind of back her up in court. So say she's you know, defending Spider-Man, someone's accusing him of doing a certain thing. She might, while on the stand, pull out kind of an issue of a 70s Spider-Man comic and be like, well, here in the kind of paper of record, if you like, we can prove that Spider-Man was at this place or this time, or, you know, you said to him at this moment, this happened, or you have had a previous run-in with so-and-so because it's here in the comic. So in the first 12 issues of Dan Slott's She-Hulk run, there are lots of interesting cases and arcs that I think it's definitely worth um, looking up um, and kind of having a read through if you can. In her first case for GLK and H, which is definitely worth reading through, um, Jennifer Walters um, works with a man who was involved in an industrial accident at Roxxon Corporation, you know, the kind of big, famous, evil Marvel um, company. Uh, he has an accident at work, um, that's not his fault, wherein he falls into a big vat of like nuclear goo, let's say, um, and he's given kind of 
big superpowers, very Superman-like, um, but unfortunately, those powers kind of result in his personal life deteriorating, his family leave him, um, he's kind of like, he's at his wit's end, doesn't know what to do, his whole life's been destroyed by this event, which although in other comics would kind of be a galvanizing thing, um, has actually left him worse for wear, and now he is looking for some sort of like monetary compensation from Roxxon. It's a really interesting arc, it's really fun, and it also is a really nice blend of um, the kind of superheroic stuff that we're talking about with the kind of sticking up for the little guy um, that we first saw Jennifer Walters do all the way back in Savage She-Hulk when she was kind of like, you know, a public attorney when she was defending people from kind of big evil companies. So it's this really nice melding of those two worlds and it's typical of what the Dan Slot run is interested in doing, is interested in bringing those two halves of the story together. There's also a bunch of other issues and arcs that are definitely worth, I mean, I would honestly say those first 12 issues of Dan Slot run, pick them up however you can. It's basically two trades, or if you've got Marvel Unlimited, it's an evening's read. Um, they're really fun. In that first arc, you get a really fun issue where we see Jennifer helping Spider-Man sue J. Jonah Jameson um, for damages, it's really funny. Um, there's a case where there's a guy who's murdered and then his ghost is a witness on his own murder trial. There's all these like really silly kind of breezy concepts, but they're written so tightly and the artwork is, is really strong. Um, so definitely worth checking out if you can. In terms of stuff that carries through um, to other She-Hulk stories and maybe the show as well, I think one character that's worth keeping an eye on in this run and who again pops up later on is Mallory Book. Um, we know she's going to be in the She-Hulk series and she is a other attorney that works at the time for GLK and H and her and Jennifer Walters sort of have this like um, uh, frenemy type situation where they're both, they're kind of like professional rivals. Um, she's a really interesting character and she pops up kind of in other issues as we go along. In issue 10 of Dan Slott's She-Hulk run, we actually get a really interesting Titania story. Remember her from Secret Wars? Um, it basically gives you like a rundown of her origin. So if you're about to watch the She-Hulk Disney Plus series and you want to know who the character is, I actually think issue 10 of the 2004 Dan Slott book is the place to start. It kind of panel by panel takes you through her journey from kind of like Ugly Duckling, as she's called in the, in the, in the comic, um, through to kind of this super powered, kind of Amazon woman. Um, it's really interesting, it's really fun, and it's a really like good, again, example of how this book does really tight arcs and really tight stories in, in one or two issues. The Dan Slot era comes to an end in 2009. The book actually runs, so it runs for 12 issues, then it has an eight month break, and then it comes back for another 26. So it runs um, through to issue 38, which is published in 2009. Um, at that point, Dan Slot is off the book. Um, he leaves in issue 22, and, and the kind of Marvel it man Peter David, if you know you know, he's writing it from 22 through 38 and actually um, it's pretty strong but I do think that first 12 issues from Dan Slott are, are definitely, I would say absolutely, if, you, if you're going to read a She-Hulk thing in a short burst before the show, that would be a really good place to start. So staying in the 21st century, in 2014 another 12 issue miniseries is released. This time it's written by Charles Sewell and drawn by Javier Polito. To be honest with you, not a lot happens in these 12 issues. Um, I think they're most notable and most noteworthy because there is a really, really good mini arc towards the back half of them. I think it's eight through 10 or six through 10, um, which sees Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk um, go up against Matt Murdock as Daredevil in court. Um, it's a really fun arc and actually it involves some other Marvel superheroes that you might know. Um, I don't want to spoil it, but it's definitely worth even just leaping through those four issues. I think it stands out. And again, as we're about to see Charlie Cox reprise his role as Daredevil in the She-Hulk Disney Plus series, it's interesting to see them interact on the page um, there first. While we're on the subject of a 2014 Charles Saul mini run, I absolutely want to shout out Kevin Wada's incredible covers. They are this really interesting kind of rich textured watercolor style. Um, they're quite striking. They're very different to the art inside the comics as is often the case, um, but they're really, they feel very contemporary. I mean, it's only eight years ago, but they feel very contemporary even now um, and they really stand out. And they remind me, if you're a comics person, they remind me very much now of the work that Phil Noto does, um, who, if you've read the X-Men Cable series by Jerry Duggan recently, um, the work there, which is kind of this blend of like, digital photorealistic art, but rendered in this very kind of textured, tactile way. Okay, so the next big thing that happens to uh, Jennifer Walters, aka She-Hulk, is actually the 2016 Marvel crossover event, Civil War II. 
We do not have time in this video to get into the events of Civil War II, much like we did not have time earlier to get into the events of Secret Wars. But what you need to know for Jennifer Walters, aka She-Hulk, is that basically right at the very beginning, she gets knocked out and put into a coma by Thanos. And then at the end of the event, she wakes back up to find her cousin Bruce um, shot and killed by Hawkeye. Following on from this event, the fallout of the death of Hulk and the impact it has on She-Hulk is seen in Mariko Tamaki's 2016 Hulk run. It's worth noting that this run, which is definitely a She-Hulk book, is just called Hulk, not She-Hulk. It's Jennifer Walters kind of taking over the mantle um, in the short term, certainly. And it's a really interesting book. It's kind of vastly different from lots of other She-Hulk stories. It was kind of controversial at the time because it is a darker take on the character, not only in terms of content and tone, but in terms of the level of introspection that Jennifer has given. You know, we're often throughout the runs have been given this internal monologue from She-Hulk, but it's always punchy and, and light and happy because that's what people love about the character, right? She is this kind of feisty, fresh, exciting character. And what Tamaki does is kind of ask us to think about what happens when you strip that away? What happens when a character like that goes through something this traumatic, when she has her kind of closest relationship taken away from her? For me, it absolutely works. Um, even without the context really of, of kind of eras before this, I think the ways in which Tamaki is able to give those darker sides of Jennifer's um, psyche kind of voice and space to breathe is A, really relatable and really, I think, gives another dimension to the character. You know, we love the kind of self-assured, punchy Jennifer and She-Hulk. Like, that's what makes us love the character, but it fleshes her out and actually kind of gives her another side and lets you, I think, appreciate all elements of the character equally, which I think is kind of the point of the character, right? She is this, she is this, this two in one. She is two sides of the same coin, like we said up front. She, she isn't constantly at war with herself in the way that Bruce and the Hulk is. She is this character that's supposed to teach us to accept all the many facets that we all contain. And I think learning to love the Tamaki run, which invites you to think about her in this way, is a really nice kind of um, symbolic way of, of thinking about her. Then finally, I promise finally, most recently in 2022, Marvel released one more or one latest, I should say, solo run for She-Hulk, uh, written by Rainbow Roll. Um, this run, I guess you probably think is, is, is released in just in time for the Disney Plus series, as Marvel often do, and is a return to kind of, all that said about Tamaki Run, this is a return to kind of like fun, light, breezy, superheroic lore stuff um, for She-Hulk and Jennifer Walters. Um, and it's really good. It's really easy to read. Um, the art is super readable. It's in that kind of 2020s Marvel house style. So it's very clear. It's very passable, like I said. And I think it's definitely worth picking up. She-Hulk, attorney at law. Okay, so now you and I know everything there is to know about She-Hulk. Let's talk a little bit about the Disney Plus series. Basically, director Jessica Gao has said that the show that she's written and created will cherry pick her favorite bits from all across the She-Hulk canon. Um, some of the stories and storylines and characters that she likes the most, she's gonna kind of put into a blender and the result will be hopefully a homage to the stories that came before, um, but also something new and that can stand on its own two feet. Some examples of She-Hulk canon that are making their way from the comics to the show include the inclusion of GLK and H, the law firm from Dan Slott's run. This, if like me, you're a fan of Dan Slott's run, is very promising. We don't need to get into it again, but obviously everything that run does when it the way it combines legal drama with kind of supernatural and superheroic stories, I think would make sense. And also I think jives with what we've seen in the trailer. So if the team from GLK and H can make their way to live action, I will be very happy. I guess the other big thing that's coming from the comics into the show, beyond obviously Jennifer herself, the inclusion of Hulk, all that stuff, is Titania. In the Secret War storyline and some comics before it, she finds out that she bears a striking resemblance to Spider-Woman. And in Secret Wars, that kind of lie that she's been telling that maybe she is Spider-Woman all comes undone when her and her friends who are transported to Battle World, don't worry about it, are rescued and saved by the actual Spider-Woman. As a result, she flees. The people that she's at the party with like seriously overreact to this situation and like hunt her down in the woods. It's very bizarre. Um, but as a result, she runs into Dr. Doom, who is impressed by her resourcefulness, her desire for power um, and her kind of like schemey nature and offers to give her superhuman powers um, if she kind of agrees to work for him. From that moment, Titania is a massive thorn in Jennifer Walters and She-Hulk's side. She pops up again and again and again. We mentioned earlier of issue number 10 in the Dan Slot run, which is definitely a great primer. But basically, she's just like a really 
kind of ridiculous, irritating villain, but she's very fun and she kind of is the like anti-She-Hulk. You know, all Marvel characters have this kind of the foil, the flip version of themselves. And in lots of ways, she is that for, uh, for Jennifer. What's interesting about this character and the adaptation that's coming is that Jamila Jamil has said in interviews that she thinks her version of Titania will be the most annoying supervillain the MCU has ever seen. This quote specifically caused some like backlash and ripples amongst the fans, but I genuinely think if you know the She-Hulk comics and you like actually really appreciate what's going on in them, like Titania is very annoying and the idea that you would play up her annoying list makes so much sense. If you're only familiar with Jamila Jamil from her casting in the She-Hulk show or maybe her social media presence, you might not have seen her on the incredibly funny comedy, The Good Place. In The Good Place, Jamil plays Tahani, this very, very funny kind of vapid vain character who's ultra rich and has always got her own way in life. And I think that could be a really funny inspiration and jumping off point for the character of Titania in the She-Hulk show. So what can we expect from the tone of the Disney Plus series? Well, Marvel head honcho Kevin Feige has described it as a half hour legal comedy and has said that it will pay homage to those classic John Byrne stories among other runs. And lead star Tatiana Maslany has called it a kind of really absurd take on a legal comedy drama, which basically is exactly what we want to hear when we think about a She-Hulk TV series. Gao has described it as a really interesting show to work on in the way that it threads a line, as so she says, between kind of half hour sitcom, legal drama, and also manages to fit itself within the kind of wider MCU. She's used examples like Ally McBeal, which is really exciting. And then for that kind of like metafictional fourth wall side of things, the obvious kind of comparison that we've seen so far is Fleabag. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's phenomenal show, I think has influenced lots of TV writers in the years since. Um, and it's really interesting to see what like V-Bag looks like in the MCU, basically. So fingers crossed we kind of get some good um, Jim Halperting, some good mugging to the camera along the way. So that's all for this week. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode of Source Material, do drop us a like and a comment and subscribe to the channel. It really does help. Um, and if you're interested in more She-Hulk coverage, we've got some interviews with the cast and crew lined up over the next few days. And also on our website, you'll find lots of interesting hot takes and features about the show weekly as it airs on Disney+. Plus.